Okay, today we have two main articles and um, set up. Yeah, I did have it all set up. Um, okay, two main articles and then some outlines, Aristotle's list of the virtues. So um, let's start with the virtue of an educated voter. What did you think of that about our founders and how worried they were about education and then how education what's happened with higher education since recently. And then also, I mean, he didn't even talk that much about K through 12 education. So what's happened with that also. So who wants to start? And honestly, I really would like you to take turns without me having to, me interrupting. Um, I'm really going to try that. I'm going to take notes. And if I had a comment for you, I'll wait to the end. All right. Who wants to start? Jordan, go ahead. I think it was like a very strong point. They emphasize education, like literature and understanding, like where your laws are coming from and like why they're being put in place. I think that was very important. But the current system that we have is monetary. So like, especially K through 12, the people who get the most funding are the people who get the highest test scores. It's more, it's more like something that is like bought and it's less to do with like, everyone deserves an equal education and more like, oh, these seem to be like brighter people in actuality, it's people who have more money. And I think that that is something that really is the differential between like a lot of liberals believe like oh you need to get educated but education costs money that that's privilege for you to say that you need to get educated and you can get educated i think that that is like a big thing that we need to talk about good i also wanted to like add how it's kind of ridiculous like on her point with the education how like how funding is your level of how like, good your education is going to be like the educational difference in America to Germany is huge it is so huge that like I could have skipped a grade the way they taught me so much I could have skipped a grade and that's that's just like mind-blowing to me how um just because their education is better than ours but here's the thing though they don't Edu most educational there is free and so is child care and health care they're taking way better care of the system because it's input into their laws and that's just mind-blowing to me that's socialism true yeah like they make such a strong point about how education benefits society but we've set up a society to where education is so hard to like a quality education is so hard to get. And like, I did a research paper on this a couple of years ago and like high school literacy rates are so crazy low now. Um, fewer and fewer are actually like graduating with a strong grasp of like the English language. Um, and so it's just so crazy how we've allowed our system to become so classist in that sense. To go off your point, classes is like the exact word to use. It, it is because like, I mean, we're in Arkansas. We are number, I, th I believe three now in literacy, like and like educated youth are not able to read at the level that they're supposed to be. And that ha is directly corresponding to what we are being funded. And <laughs> I think that it's insane to think that like everyone is told that in order to get a good job, you need to go to college, but then they have no opportunities to go to college, you know, like that is insane. I think one thing that's being overlooked in the is the like tech degrees and things of that nature. Instead of getting a high school diploma, sometimes if you get a tech degree, you might be doing way better than other people who do have college diplomas, like welding, especially underwater, like from Florida, we have underwater welding as a tech school. 
um when the kids came out he's making like two hundred and fifty thousand dollars a year for doing that so he'll do that for 10 years but he's getting that as like an 18 year old too and to that point like I do feel like we also have started to like not necessarily look at the value of trade school anymore especially like I'm here in southeast Texas we I can see an oil refinery from my backyard and so a lot of people I know just end up at the refinery and I mean they're making good money but it doesn't change the fact that our literacy, our literacy rates are so low and being able to read is such a vital part of being a functioning citizen that even if they are, you know, retiring as millionaires, they still are struggling to read basic documents. Um, I would add that like also, like, you know, going and doing something like that and making a lot of money, especially out of high school um, is like a great thing, but we also are not taught in any capacity like, how to handle money um, in high school or like anything of that literacy, nature. yes. Yeah, we're not taught like anything of that nature. And that is like, like that, that is a huge part of life, like forever, it's a huge part of life, um, so. Wait, you guys don't have a financial literacy like class or like semester, like part of a semester? No. No. I mean, in, I mean, whenever I was, I've taken was in high school. Financial literacy was a optional course that many people took, but it wasn't offered until my senior year. And I had like a half year off, like or half my uh, day was off to go uh, work. So it's not something that's even offered until my senior year, and then it's not offered until like the afternoon. And most people in my situation have to work. So it's not something that's really applicable to a lot of people, at least personally. I want to go think, off of, oh, oh, I was no, going to say, I want to go off of, I, I don't know who said it, but about how going to college, if you want to, we're all taught, and even the teachers tell you, you want to get a job, you got to go to college, but that's kind of unfortunate because some people, like whoever said that, they can't afford it. And I think personally, you should all have an equal opportunity because you never know who could be a, a genius, but you don't have the money to incorporate that genius mind frame. With that, you have to like, I know a lot of the people who live in this area, they couldn't afford to go to a college. So a lot of times they'll go to another country, become a citizen and use the benefits of that country to get a free college education because in some countries, actually a lot of you, um, like Europe countries, they offer free college. I think Iceland, Greenland, Switzerland, New Zealand, like all these countries are providing free education because they want the people to know, to have the knowledge of these basic things, but we, we aren't. And to go back to what you were talking about trade school, I was actually in a welding program um, and unfortunately I was discriminated against because I was a woman. Like a lot of men were given like opportunities that I weren't. I think that was because of the area I was in, but I was specifically going to welding to be an underwater welder because I was like, hey, use my hands, you know, lots of money involved. But I think it's in the South more, I don't really know, but it was something that was discouraged upon me because I was a woman. And I don't know how it is for other people, but like trade school is something that is very like important like engineering things that you can get into right after college. But that's what not really what people are focused on are told about, you know. I think another thing about the way our like higher education system is set up is with it being so expensive, um, a lot of people rely on scholarships. But a lot of those scholarships are going towards, you know, top students and most of the top students can afford to get extra tutoring or they go to a top public school or private school. And then when it comes to like athletic scholarships, uh, sports costs a lot of money, like depending on the sport you're in, you have to pay to travel, you need equipment, you need private lessons, like all these things cost so much money just to get like free money at the end. To add to that, one of the cheapest sports cross country is quite 
quite expensive because in most local areas you don't have those cross-country courses plus you also need the spikes the hydration the coaching just being able to go to the track meets I know that one of my friends who was in cross country she spent a total of three hundred and fifty dollars just to go to the cross country meet with gas and like eating and all those things um I would also say like I feel like a lot of times like um it's actually like the people kind of in the middle that really get left out when we talk about scholarships and things because people who um are kind of like rich like yeah they have like they're already set up to like go to college like you know that they're gonna go to college and then like like I come from a very poor background but I also get like a lot of like government assistance to go to college and then I have a lot of friends who's like who don't fall into either of those categories and they're in more like financial duress than I am um which is like an interesting thing to to see yeah Ryan made a comment about it like Ryan's was talking about how her parents are well off but she not well enough and to like send her to college like you know pay for it all but there was no financial aid available I think there's like a disconnect about how much college costs and how much people are getting I think that's like the main thing because college used to cost like compared to now nothing like people could go to get a part-time job and pay for college and that is just not something that is available anymore yeah, just speaking on that, like, it's, well, okay, Hawaii's been, I mean, a lot of the scholarships that, like, I, for even my school, like, I only got one scholarship from them, and other than that, like, I applied for, like, several other ones, and I haven't gotten a single one, because mostly all the scholarships here, at least back in Hawaii, is all financial need based so just speaking on that, like, my family falls, like, I would say upper middle class, but so my parents can't pay fifty thousand dollars for school, but then also we don't get financial aid best like um based scholarships. So I don't get any like financial aid, nothing, no government assistance, and even schools like you know like subsidized unsubsidized loans like for example Lion like that and work study like I don't even qualify to work on campus. Like I don't think that's really right, and I'm like what? So it's just really really difficult, and I feel like that's a bit unfair. So I feel like, um, yeah, it's just definitely the people that's in between that gets hurt, you know? And so I think that's really unfortunate. We also have to think that people go off your parents' money. That's what I was going to say. That is exactly what I was going to say. My mom makes six figures. She got herself a new Louis Vuitton bag last week. She can afford anything. But once I'm at college, the rule is I pay for what I want. I pay for my own gas. I pay for my own groceries. I pay if I need a new pair of cleats, I got to pay for it. If I need textbooks, I got to pay for it. So it's ridiculous how they're going off the parents pay and not your pay. Because if they look at my bank account, they're going to see a whole bunch of zeros and they're going to give me that money. But if they look at my mom, they're going to be like, she doesn't need it. She has her mother's support. But the whole point of college is to be away from your parents and to have your own, like to break free and, have, and like do your own. This is, this is kind of like we're being pushed into the real world, but not really. So why am I still attached to my parents if I'm a legal adult? And then on top of that, the expectation that your parents are going to pay, I think is like a higher class ideal set that your parents are going to pay for this and that like and on top of that they're going to pay for like your ability to eat your ability to go out and do things because the main part of college and like enjoyable thing about college is being around people and being out to go do things that you weren't able to do if you have to pay like us fifty thousand dollars per semester and then on top of that you have to have some money to live it's just hard to like do both you know how much is lying per year? A lot. It totally depends on student. <laughs> it really does. Oh, what is the sticker price that? Oh, it's like, like 40,000. 40, 40, 40, 40, it's up like, like 40, per year per semester. I think it increased. Yeah. No, per year it's like 42,000. Okay. Mm, yeah. Um, yeah. Very many shows in my bank account just to. To say that again. Oh, just to go off of what um Lexi said, I, I've heard that story so many times because I know some people who like have parents who make a lot of money and this the school just automatically thinks they to get it from them. Some people do, but and 
all retrospect, why would their son or their daughter go to college and they're still taking care of them? The whole point is to, like she said, get them out of there, let them learn themselves. They can grow up as an um, adult. But I don't, I don't, I think personally, if they would, whoever the school board is, they take themselves into the consideration of like how they would treat their kids. Would you let, would you just take care of them or, or would you let them be their own? So it's like, I don't know why they treat it as well. Like, oh, the parents, well, you know, if you're like, some people aren't even from here, especially at Lyon. So you really think the parents are going to take care of them? Like you got to, you got to kind of, you know what I'm saying? Like you got to kind of retrospect that, especially people from Arkansas as well. Because you're in by this, um, because you're by the school doesn't mean they're going to take care of you. You got to, they want you to be an adult yourself. Okay. So here's the project. If you want a society, if you want a democratic society, that's what the founders were worried about, right? You have to educate the population, right? Everybody, as many as you can. So do you remember right from the start, it was a problem of taxing people so that you could have public education and people didn't want to pay taxes. And so that's how the education faltered. So we still have this problem, right? And um, so the project is, how do you educate the public? And it, it includes K through 12, right? Because if K through 12 education is bad in someone's neighborhood, they're never even going to qualify for college or for trade school or community college or anything if they had such a terrible high school or junior high, you know, all the way down. So, um, so in order to think like a citizen, you have to think outside, right? You have to think about, all right, how do we try to lift people up so that they're educated enough not to get manipulated by, by rhetoric, right? Our founders are really worried about that. Because in Europe, they saw there were monarchies and aristocracies that, and they were corrupt because the children knew I could be any sort of jerk I want and I'm still gonna become the king or I'm still gonna be in this class. And so our founders wanted a society where you actually earn, you deserve, right? You work for what you get, which is really important. So what Jefferson talked about a merit-based aristocracy instead of a class-based. So that's a, that's a great idea. It's just that, how do you get it? Um, and Jefferson actually was given money. I, I don't think, I think I cut this out of the article, but he was given money after the War of 1812, and he had to decide whether to found a, a major university with the, with the hope that the people who graduated from that would go out into the frontier and start educational uh, institutions. The other alternative was to give the money locally and hope that the the local government would actually set up a good educational system. Well, what happened is he chose the university and that's where um, uh, Char Charlottesville is where the University of Virginia is that Jefferson started, but there were not enough people who graduated from there and then went out in the frontier to lift up the the populace, so you'd get a, a populace. So one of the big problems was that the aristocratic class just kept wanting, they didn't want public education. They wanted, because then they'd have to pay taxes and they'd much rather have their private tutors and then send their children to Europe to get educated. But, you know, our founders, that's not democratic. That'll, that'll end up with an aristocracy. And it will end up with powerful people able to manipulate the public into doing whatever they want. So it's going to end up with corruption. Um, and so we still have, I think we still have those problems. Does that make sense to you? I mean, in a lot of ways, um, 
the elite schools are so expensive that we, we pretty much have an elite. We have education according to how much money you can make um, rather than according to your natural ability and according to your effort. So education alone is something somebody could work on. They could work their whole entire life on trying to get more equitable education. Uh, Ryan? Um, while you were saying that, and I forgot, I was gonna mention this earlier when everybody else was saying stuff, but this kind of reminded me of like the college admission scandals. Yeah. This I, like, you know, just the idea of like parents paying their way, the back door, the back door, the side door, or whatever they called it, there was like a term, but they would basically have this guy do fake tutorings and basically they would get onto sports teams. And as an athlete myself, I was just totally taken aback because, I mean, I went through the recruitment process. It's very, very difficult. And it's just to think that people were able to do that just and get onto teams that, and took spots and rosters from people who like, dedicated their whole life to it is just totally insane but i mean there's probably a way bigger well there is a way bigger population of kids that just get in like academic academically and do like that backdoor thing because it's a little bit more easier to spot on a sports team but i'm but like i i mean i'm not gonna make accusations but there's been a lot of girls that i've played soccer with growing up in hawaii and i've seen how they play they, they live in the richest part of the island and you know their parents own big companies and they're not the best soccer player but they signed into usc went into stanford went to all of these really really good schools and all like through athletics but i mean i'm not gonna make accusations but it's just a little suspicious but it's very disappointing but that made me like question like is corruption because we talked about like society being corrupt like is that kind of inevitable like, is there any way to really fix it? Because I feel like we throw out solutions, but then it's like, if we have too much restrictions, then are we really giving everybody the freedom? You know, like what if their parents want them to be sent to another country to get college prep education? You know, is that like somebody else's right to make that decision? But then also, like you said, it's creating a type of, you know, er er I can't say the word, aristocracy. Okay. Yeah, like, you know, it's like, we want to make society better, but is it also infringing on people's rights? Uh, you know. I think that mostly has to do with the fact that we have to pay for college. I think if like free education was a thing, it would take away a lot of this um, almost like gatekeeping of knowledge. It seems like in places that value higher education, it's given freely. It's because they want to have those people go back into society and like fun society in the ways that they are educated. I think in our case, the fact that they're so like college is so freaking expensive and so hard to get by, it really makes it hard for people to be like, well, we're on an even playing field because we're not. If I am starting my basis like right here, it's like the trash can example or like the basketball example. You know, like if I'm starting right here, it's easier for me to make a basket than if someone who's starting back here, you know, it, it, it's a lot harder for me to get a higher education if they don't have the, like the education to begin with. And it starts in like elementary school, who gets funding, who gets funding based on certain test scores and why do they get certain test scores? Is it because these kids are less intelligent? No, it's because they don't have as much funding and they don't have as much like background to that. It, it's it's like a whole system about education that needs to be kind of overturned because if we look at it like everyone is on the same playing field, uh, then it's not really accurate at all. If we think back to all those like movies that we all used to laugh at, like those Disney movies where like the girl who's super into like the arts and stuff, but the school is going to cut her club out unless she gets some funding and then she magically gets the funding because of some stupid fundraiser that's actually happening it's ridiculous because it's also happening with the skill-based learning stuff we were just talking about like um I know here we just got rid of a whole bunch of skill-based learning classes because we couldn't afford to keep it open and um it's honestly pretty sad and it's not de democratic that's the problem go ahead 
Um, I think another thing is like the schools that Ryan was mentioning and then like the college admission scandals, those are public schools. Yeah, public schools have gotten so insanely expensive. Like my younger brother, he just toured the University of Texas this last week and it's $30,000 just to go. And that is a, like, it's a publicly funded school. How could it be that expensive? Especially when it's one of the biggest in Texas. So you're getting around $30,000 from like 5,000 kids. I'm, I'm probably under scoring that. Like, it's just insane how much they're getting. And like, it, it does go back to like high school. I know I went to three different high schools because I moved around a lot. And the one I ended up graduating from, like we're in rural Southeast Texas, we only had two AP classes offered. And I know kids that come into APs with like, come into college with like seven different APs and we only had AP Calc and like AP Bio and stuff. And that was it. You couldn't have anything else. And so I just think it's so crazy. It's crazy. Um, so also we value STEM more than the humanities, right? At least Alyssa. So you don't have any AP history or AP English or anything like that. Um, it is true though, uh, to get into college, you need good SAT scores and Actually, it costs $7,000 to pay for a tutor uh, to score higher on the SAT. At least this one, it costs uh, Glenn Hedges. He just gave that example with his son. And his son said um, that, that his son read a lot, but he scored low on the reading. And so he paid $7,000 and he, he didn't like it because he's written a lot about the corruption of the academy and how it's all based on class. Um, but then the tutor told him, don't think, okay? And that was, you know, his son read, but he read and he was always thinking about what he read. And so that's why he scored lower on the SAT. And so the tutor just told him, don't think just read the stuff and figure out what they're looking for, right? Don't overthink it. You pay $7,000 for that. Uh, and I mean, I identify with that because I had exactly the same problem. I thought a lot. And when I took the SAT, I remember telling myself, don't think, right? Or you're, you're screwed. And I never did. Um, I never did score all that well, I scored well enough, but. So what does it reward? It rewards people, sir, it rewards STEM and it rewards people who don't think for themselves, but who read somebody else's work and analyze it. And that's true all the way through. PhD, journals, books, you name it. I've you know, I talk to professionals and I say, well, what do you think? Not what Plato thinks, you know, quote here, quote there. What do you think? And they've never thought, like, what do you think justice is? I swear to God, I'm not quite sure some of my colleagues think about that. It's like that scene from Goodwill Hunting whenever <laughs> they're in the bar and he's like, well, that I wouldn't think that because the, da, 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 and he was like quoting directly from a text. And he, he was like, when are you going to have any actual ideas of your own? And because that is what's pushed by most education systems, that this is what you're learning. Don't think outside the box. That's why I like liberal arts education, because they emphasize, this is what we are taught. What do you think about that? And where do you expand upon that? Okay, so I also want to point out that an article, you know, sometimes people say, oh, Dr. Beck, just, you just have your opinion. It's no big deal. But I really think an educated opinion and an uneducated opinion is what drives human history. So it is a big deal, right? Um, and so I thought this article, you know, students at Lyon have opinions about education, right? <laughs> because they, that's something they have skin in the game on. But you have to think, people have skin in the game on healthcare. They have skin in the game on housing. <laughs> They have skin in the game on military. They have, you know, everybody's got 
some little thing that's their thing. But if we don't learn how to think outside of our box and to just think about, well, what about everybody, right? Think about citizenship. So um, I do, I really think it is important for you to question yourself, you know? If you're getting to the point where am I only thinking about my own interest here, or am I really thinking about the country? It's, and of course, I think that's especially true when it comes to, um, let's see, when it comes to education, because I'm an educator. <laughs> but, um, you know, I, I think it's terrible that liberal arts colleges cost so much and they are dying. There aren't, this is, I don't know how many of them are going to survive. I also think that um, there's ways that professors, I don't really think this is true of Lyon professors, so I'm not saying anything about my colleagues. Um, they, they go to universities and they have professors who profess, they're always telling them about their specialty. And then they go to grad school at a university and they don't, that's very different than a liberal arts educator who just asks students to talk and think and rethink and make their opinions transparent and make themselves accountable, right? So, um, yeah, so everyone agrees in theory that education is important, but how are you going to pay for it, right? And, you know, you guys all have to think about that. Education is an individual achievement versus a social benefit. So I, another thing I wanna impress on you is that people think philosophy is not important, but they don't see that their whole experience with any kind of system, in this case, the educational system, they, it had a philosophy behind the people who constructed this system have a philosophy and that philosophy is driving what it is you're experiencing. Does everybody understand that? Because I mean, that really is my, my big thing that a lot of people think philosophy is esoteric and it's just professors sitting in their offices and blowing steam and it's completely irrelevant to everybody else. And what I'm saying is it is the cornerstone of everything else. So people who have set up an educational system where the rich get richer and the poor get poorer, don't apologize for that. It's their philosophy. If you work harder, you'll make enough money to put your kid through college. So it's on you, you know, to work harder. Um, all right. So the other thing to impress on you, if you, you know, if you want to go back to the founding fathers and think about what they were worried about, right? So sometimes people go, I don't want to go back to the founding fathers. They were sexist, racist, blah, blah, blah. Well, partly so. This isn't about educating African Americans or women. On the other hand, the Supreme Court is going back to the founders and saying things like, well, they didn't talk about, there were no environmental laws at the beginning, so there shouldn't be any now. Literally, they made a decision saying that. So the Air Clean Air Act is getting um, weakened. And the reason is it's not in the original constitution. Abortion is not. In, so so when, when I say, let's go back to the founders, I really pick and choose. And I know that I'm picking and choosing, but this I think was something of, they were really concerned about whether you're Republican or Democrat or anything, you know, it's, it's very important that the public knows how to think like a citizen. And this was as true in Athens. I kept emphasizing Athens was set up to get people to think like a citizen. Um, well, and then on top of that, um the founders said that they wanted to re, like re um, revisit the constitution every 20 years okay. so that we could 
that our foundation of society isn't based on people who are dead. That is what they suggested. And they also didn't want a two-party system. So, like, to say this is the word of our founders, it should be by law. Whenever our, us as a civilization has advanced so much more than it was 200 years ago, it's kind of insane. Well, and the way it's structured is to be adaptable. So you can have a constitutional amendment and you have case law. And the whole point of that is not to get stuck in a rigid ideology. Does that make sense, Jordan? Plus revisiting the concept. I mean, that thing was set up to be adaptable to change because the divine right of kings that they overthrew was they refused to change or they changed to a constitutional monarchy and that helped. But anyway, yeah, I totally agree with you, Jordan. But anyway, when I say, let's get back to the founders, <laughs> I have a very specific agenda. Um, but you have to imagine, just imagine, they're leaving Europe. They don't want to go back to monarchies and aristocracies. And for, they knew that America I, would be an oligarchy, right? The rule of the rich. They don't want any of that. And they don't want the public to get manipulated by the privileged who know rhetoric, the power of rhetoric. Same thing happened in Athens. They read about the Greeks, right? They read about Athens. So, um, and the US was internally uh, divided, still is. Uh, we need a national identity uh, that voters were not educated, right? And so there were all these possibilities that the military could take over. Um, so this is another major point that I was kind of very surprised that the professor uh, said, well, we need virtue, right? The capacity to transcend diverse interests. This is exactly Aristotle's practical wisdom. Do you remember? I mean, I hope you associate that with my list of the political virtues and statecraft. Does that make sense to you? That a good state per, statecraft is weaving the rich and the poor together to create a middle class. And you can only do that if you learn how to think about the common good. Um, if everybody just pursues their private interest, it would end up destabilizing and being taken over by demagogues. Um, okay. So that's what Socrates was trying to do. Okay, Aristotle and Benjamin Bush. Um, uh, okay, so in a monarchy, an aristocracy, a democracy, the citizens have to be educated. We have to, we've changed our form of government, but we have to have a revolution in our opinions and manners and our habits so that we can actually take on this uh, responsibility of citizenship. Problem is who pays, right? And so the wealthy didn't want to pay. Jefferson wanted to try to tax the rich. Um, I think Mr. Wirt, uh, you know, he says all anybody cares about is getting richer. And he says buying his wife a bonnet or himself a pair of boots, you know, it's, a, it's the equivalent to whatever it is today. Greed is the worst political evil. So these people, again, they read their Aristotle and they said, he's right, you know? Um, so the state legislators, if you wanna raise taxes, you won't get reelected. Does that sound familiar? Um, so this is a problem. And then another thing I do think it's important to know the history that the North got way ahead of the South in education. And when you get way ahead in education, you're gonna get way ahead in everything else. Um, and so the New Yorkers had enough foresight to know that you needed to have a good public education system in order to move forward in the future. And so the South got like 50 years behind, which I do think is really important because we live with this history. Um, and then we have life is still there today that the South is uneducated. There I know news that don't need to be like who can't be taught. Like that is a political belief still today. What the people are not capable. Yes, that's yeah. That that is really where I draw the line. I mean, I don't have to read the founders to know people are capable 
of citizenship. They're capable of identifying when somebody's trying to punch their buttons. But if they're constantly bombarded with this bath of uh, rhetoric, let's just put it, it, it is hard. It is hard. It's appealing to fear. It's designed to appeal to fear. But you're going to lose your democracy. <laughs> anyway. Um, all right, so there were these huge leap forwards. And then in the 1970s, then it started to change. And this is what I've lived through because I went to college in the 70s. So I've watched this happen and it makes, yeah, I grieve about it, right? And um, so my parents were middle-class, but they did make sacrifices for college and I made sacrifices for my children. My husband and I paid half our salaries so the kids could get through college. So we lived on half our salaries. And that was fine, that was a top priority. So everything else was brand X, but the college was Cadillac or whatever it is they wanted. Um, so the philosophy changed from a social and political good to an economic good. And now you don't, you're not educated in those virtues, uh, temperance and generosity. You're not, you know, the system is designed for you to become greedy. Um, so for example, you want to be a doctor, well, you end up with $350,000 in debt. Well, you're not going to, you know, you're going to want to make money. Um, so it's really set up to nurture greed. And greed is what destroys democracy. So my God, this is not looking good. Uh, a, lo a lot of people make money through advertising that really appeals to people's lower instincts and selfishness or fear. So, you know, it's not, it's not good. But I do think um, it's only in a liberal arts school where you, I would actually assign, the teacher would assign an article like this. I mean, it looks like, oh, this stuff is all around, you know, you, anybody can read it, but they don't read it, right? Nobody would read this unless you were assigned to read it. And I do think it's just the start of getting some perspective on things. And I think that if you read a few articles and you think, maybe I want to read like a whole book about what's happened to education. There are a lot of books out. And um, because you get this feeling that, geez, there's a history there. And so what I'm seeing in front of my face is driven by a philosophy and a history. And, and if you don't think about that, it's going to continue to be driven by what's there, if nobody questions it. And if it's good, good. But if it's bad, you're in trouble. So when it was considered a social good, and people didn't think twice, and they paid taxes, that was fine. But then it switched. And people aren't thinking about that, that the idea of the good, the overall idea driving the whole system has changed and changed in a way that's making the rich richer and the poor poor. Um, cuts to K through 12. And um, since the recession, again, cuts for schools. How did the recession happen? Greed, that's how it happened. Greedy people were doing all this crap. It wasn't like, it was pure greed that was that drove the housing crisis and all that stuff. Um, poor people tend to need more Medicare. It's a lot of healthcare is unnecessary. It's because of people's habits. Um, and also a food system that's based on greed and wrecks your body. Um, so yeah, you have all these problems and brought, it pays off, right? It's just long-term, it pays off. So you can't look at the immediate. People will have stories about, yeah, this kid went to community college and I paid my taxes and the kid flunked out. Okay, but it costs a lot more money if you don't give them another chance, right? If they just sit. Um, okay. So the, the thing that uh, annoyed me about the article was he said, um, nowadays there is no one creed and it's just like to me these classical virtues that i teach is 
a set of categories, which is perfectly legit, like no problem. So here's a historian, didn't even like suggest Aristotle. He's, and he even suggested Protestant Christianity, which, you know, the Catholic church was the Aristotelian base. So, I mean, it seems pretty ignorant about our intellectual history, but anyway, I do want you to think about that. I, I want you to take it seriously because this is an issue where you have skin in the game. Like, you know, what, what their forefathers have set up for you has affected you. But what are you going to do about it? And what are you going to pass on to your children? And also, think about every single issue it has this same history, this convoluted history, this complex history. And what happened in the past affects what's going on now. And so you need to be educated to figure out, well, how can I just drive the ship you know, in this direction rather than that direction? Uh, because it makes a lot of difference. If you just move this, you know, point the ship a little bit differently, after a while, you've got a huge difference. And that's the way societies work, really. Um, so then I applied all of Aristotle's um, virtues so that so I guess I I want to ask you do you think you know it's a loaded question of course but can you understand how just studying these basic virtues can help you understand you know citizenship and I'm sorry I got this messed up um the value of education and get into some kind of understanding of what's going on in the country with the realization that it really matters. It's not just a matter of opinion. Uh, the public, when the politicians refer to education as a motive, you know, a reason to vote for me rather than someone else. And then they start talking about, well, what, how would you change it? Blah, blah, blah. Do you think um, looking at it through the lens of Aristotle's virtues, gives you some insight or, you know, it's a loaded question. No one's going to say no, I guess. But which aspect of it do you think helped? Which part of this article do you think made you more woke than you were before? <laughs> Is, you know, makes you think of an important aspect of trying to educate the citizen that you would like people to remember moving forward. Um, Alexis, what do you think? I'm trying to figure out something for my aunt right now. Like everyone's losing power around me. So I'm trying oh, to figure okay. out if I'm okay. Okay. I'll just start with Colin. What do you think, Colin? I am so sorry, but my internet here is very unstable. I only heard my my name and nothing before that. So what is the question? Actually, it's what what point from this article stands out? Or do you think having that list of Aristotelian virtues gives you some insight, right? It gives you this framework according to which he's describing the problem, right? Aristotle says greed is the political evil. This guy says greed is destroying our capacity to educate people, right? Aristotle says the political virtues are learning how to think like a citizen. This guy says, we really need to bring back this virtue of thinking like a citizen. Um, was there any one thing or the fact that the South got way behind, 50 years behind? I mean, was there some aspect of the article that stands out to you that you think you, think you should know this as a citizen? if you're going to be able to get engaged meaningfully in some discussion of our educational system. Greed within education is like, especially in high school um, with like college applications and things of that nature and like high school ranking. Um, I think that pins students against each other, especially once we get to 
I'm not really saying like undergrad, but I'm saying like graduate school when they're pinned against each other as well. Again, uh, it's making more of like a cutthroat environment. So the degree is very high. Um, one of the things that I do enjoy about Florida is Bright Futures too, which kind of for some people like myself, it leveled out for the greed because it pays for a certain percentage of your tuition, depending on your community service and um, GPA, SAT and or ACT scores. So I got it to the point where I could have 100% for Bright Futures. So after that, I didn't really care about where like I fell in rankings and things of that nature, but for some people that's not enough. They want that drive and to be the best, even if it like expenses at others. So it's competitive and adversarial system instead of cooperative? Yes. And can you understand how you're gonna lose your democracy if you do that? Okay, somebody else or somebody go because I do want everyone to comment. Um, something that it made me think about with about um, the South getting 50 years behind in education is just how often that's thrown around without the consideration of um, like all the people of color that live in the South. Because um, like if you look at the all the like Ivies of the South, they're all extremely expensive schools. And like the people who lost because of this 50 year gap are the poor people that could move away, like rich white people who had slaves and stuff like that. They were fine to continue on with all the money they had. But I mean, a majority of people of color live in the South and you're just acting like they don't exist when they're the ones that were hurt the most by this dis discrepancy. I also think that like, I was gonna bring this up, but like the education system in general also like, it's very white. Very white. There are many other ways and forms that it doesn't, you know, whitewashed. Whitewashed. Yeah. Um, like historically, like the history that we, the history that we like learn is very whitewashed, um, which like kind of, like Alyssa was saying, like doesn't really uh, support the um, the demographics that live in the South. I think, like it, to add to that, I think that the um, the fifty years behind aspect has affected like people southernly and also like racistly like racially because we have a larger percentage of african-american people in the south and they have lost stereotypes against them that they're uneducated they're a b and c which just aren't accurate especially if you look at like what what you were talking about which is we start 50 years behind it just it adds up to each other when you look at stereotypes of the south uh, stereotypes of class, stereotypes of, you know, all the above, it all ties back to education. And it's not like to the fault of Southerners that we are 50 years behind. It has to do with who won the war. And I'm not saying that who won the war was wrong, but I'm saying that it's because of that that we were put into a lower class, like the antebellum era, where we had to build back up from what we were and to get to the point we are. And so people kind of see like an elevated class, like they think they're better than because they started at a certain uh, point that we had to work up to. Okay, who else? I, I guess we have to move on, but the other thing is the way um, it, go ahead. Uh, when, um, not that I'm saying y'all are wrong, like y'all were spot, but like, just my process on the whole situation, how like we're 50 years behind and how like the whole, like even though considerably we are 50 years behind, technically we're more than 60 years behind if we think about it. Okay. Um, because um, well, just with just like, looking at the statistics and how education was taught, like it, it is pretty whitewashed. We don't know that the holiday called June 15th that's what I'm thinking talking about right now because a lot of the slaves didn't know they weren't slaves anymore until June 15th six years later so that even puts us even further behind in my opinion no and it's also the non-union jobs you know companies came to the south because 
they could pay workers less and the, and the, there's no environmental laws. The state laws are create a worse quality of the environment, worse healthcare, worse um, um, wages. And also Alabama, just to give one example, it passed a law. Okay, the federal government makes a law that you have to report if somebody gets seriously injured or dies in, at work. And Alabama passed a law that says you don't have to report it. <laughs> so the federal government says, you know, you're accountable for that. And then Alabama says, yeah, but no one's going to find out. And so they do, they can get around the federal law. So, I mean, it's just, it's intersectional, right? Intersectionality. Education is tied to your salary. And then if you can't, oh, anyway, it goes on and on. But as long as you start to understand that everything's connected, and then you start to see yourself within this incredibly complicated system, where did you step in? What were your advantages? What your disadvantages? And what do you want to do moving forward? Okay. So then the other one is about management or leadership. And so I'm, I just use my imagination, basically taking those virtues, what kind of a company or organization. I have students who write about um, their coaches, coaching, because coaching is a leadership uh, role model and um, coaches or managers of businesses or administrators of any kind of institution, really. So um, I'm going to have to rush through this, but I hope, you know, you could figure out yourself without even getting lectured on it, that here's how you can promote self-control, how you, courage is a huge deal for leaders. They have to take risks. They're going to get criticized either way. Um, but I think most people, instead of just complaining about your boss, you should be thinking about, well, what do you think would be the right way? And you can teach yourself how to lead so that eventually when you get a leadership position, you'll, you'll have thought through some stuff. If all you do is complain, you're not learning anything and you won't know what to do when you get in a situation like that. Um, all right, being even tempered, that's really important. Uh, having a sense of humor, uh, friendship. Like if, you're, if you create a good business climate, people um, have goodwill for each other, they work together and they encourage each other, educate each other. Um, they don't compete against each other. Um, they, and they avoid, you know, all these various vices that there's so many ways that a system can get corrupted. Um, sociability, you just get along. I mean, I did this on the video, right? So you already know all this stuff. So I went through all this on the video. And then in relation to government, it's very important to do everything to weave together the rich and the poor. Um, uh, try not to say government good, government bad, business good, business bad. You know, the best things are mixes of things. There's no absolutes in political stuff. There might be something that worked well five years ago that doesn't work now. And that's what our founders wanted, the whole system to be adaptable. Um, okay, so, and I, I claim, you know, that these are universal values. So there's cultural differences, obviously, but I think underneath all the cultural differences, there are these basic um, ideas or goals everybody needs to keep in mind to keep the society strong. And I guess the number one thing, I used to teach business ethics, the number, the biggest issue is your philosophy about what is the place of business in the society. And so if you think business is supposed to be at the wheel driving society versus actually quality of life is what should drive society and business supports that. It provides um, economic prosperity, but it also supports education, healthcare, transportation, recreation, you know, quality stuff. 
business doesn't see itself as the goal. It sees itself as the necessary means to achieve any goal. But the goal is over and above just making money. And within a company, your goal is to have a good climate, high quality of life, not just to make money. Um, all right, Zane, what do you think? Okay, guys. Um, yeah, yeah, I'm here. Um, I was just thinking like, yeah, um, I believe it is important. Uh, one second, one second. Let me fix something real quick. So how about I'll go to Tim here, because I didn't call on him at the end last time. Well, um, well, the sis said out to me about the education, honestly. I just don't understand personally why it's so like as like so withdrawn to certain a lot of people. Like free education. If everybody had free education, I feel as well, I feel like the nation would be better. More people would be in better jobs, less people would be working like smaller jobs, stuff like that. But I don't know. I'm still kind of debating for my thoughts. So my he mentioned jobs and my brain just went spiraling. Uh, my friend made a comment the other day and it just brought the it what he said just brought that back how like smaller jobs and how people who need more money like adults who have who need to pay for rent stuff like that should have the bigger jobs and someone mentioned to me that it was like retail and uh so like how was it when it what is it customer service jobs are usually teenagers people who are just getting a job and that's how it should be and like um it should be mandated for everyone to have because once you've gone through customer service or retail you have such a better like open mind to other people I've never met a person who has worked in retail and then get angry at someone who is in retail for doing something that's out of their control like I go shopping nowadays after working four years in retail and this girl was like, I am so sorry. I just could not find it. I'm going to have my manager. Da, da, da. I was like, girl, take your time. I'm, I'm here. I'm here. It's just opening your mind. And I feel like that would open a lot of other people's mind and they would be more empathetic. I think that's the word. Sorry. When he said jobs, that's compassionate. Thanks, Ryan. Yeah, I, that just opened my mind as soon as he said jobs. I was like, everyone should do it. Like what Alexa is saying is like just understanding where people are coming from. I feel like we're such an individualistic society that unless they feel like they can understand where you're coming from, they can't empathize with you as a person. So like people who are working minimum jobs are like, we cannot live off this pay, which is why we see the pay increase we have now. But people who have never worked that job or worked it whenever it like the minimum wage was actually livable are like well they're being greedy they're doing this then that it's just no like it's insane to say that they're being greedy when they can barely live off what they're getting uh mcdonald's put out a pay that was like you can w work and live off our pay if you have a second job only if we have a second job and it, that's an insane model to live off of that like in order to be able to live a life at all that you have to have a second job Yeah, um, that just, we talked about this a few days ago about like how, I don't know if they specifically said the government, not I think it's the government, but government and the elites or whatever try to turn like people against people, but like everyday kind of people. And it's like, I think definitely the minimum wage should go up because the living wage, like people cannot even afford to live, but <laughs> like that doesn't even make sense. And then the, if you don't even have a house, you can't even apply to a job. So, but you need a job to get a house so how is that going to work it doesn't and so but with that said 
I believe that with a with a minimum wage going up, everything else should be going up as well. Like in the terms of like other job pay should be going up. Like for example, my sister, she just well, she graduated a couple years ago, but she's trying to go uh, go back to school and get her nursing and all of this stuff. But right now she's like working on the phone and like you know answering calls, and she's only getting paid sixteen dollars an hour, and she has a degree, and like she's trying to find a job, but she needs to get this job to get experience to get the next job. So it's like the minimum wage should go up, but then also everything else. But that's the hard thing is like, how is the government going to regulate how to like how much companies need to give their people and then also mandate? Like that's the reason why people get frustrated is because when the minimum wage goes up, it like, yes, it's good that the gap is closing, but then also it's kind of harder because it's like people who got their education spent the money like every like everyone were in this position where have to get loans or whatever it may be. We put ourselves there. We spent four years of our lives. Instead of doing something else, we got our education. And so we made all these sacrifices. So we should be getting, like, I, I agree, like that we should be getting paid for the time that we spent in college. Or at Everyone least- Everyone should be getting paid enough to live on. Yeah, and that should be a bare minimum. Like, there's no way you should be working and barely living. That doesn't make any sense to me. And then I think that's why it's hard because this the, the system kind of pegs each other against each other it because does. it's like frustrated because when the gap is closing, it's like, wait, why is the minimum wage literally the same that I'm getting paid after I spent four years at college and I'm $60,000 in debt? Like, it's like, what? So that's why it's, it's a system issue. Like, just like we're talking about, like, it's a system. And it's like, the next steps is how do we fix it? Like, can it be fixed? Well... Um, if you give up trying to fix it, it'll get worse, guaranteed. I mean, what you were saying is like, I think that is intentional, like to pit the lower class and the middle class against each other. So we don't see that the higher, like the upper class is the one who's benefiting from all of this so that we get mad at each other. Cause like, why do you deserve this? Why do you deserve that? Whenever they have everything. Like, I think that is intentional. And one thing too is like, um, with the minimum wage, like just look at the different types of stores that offer uh, different types of wages. Like my sister used to work at Target for a few years and I think their starting pay is $15 an hour, but Walmart is, it's definitely lower than that. I don't know how much it is. And like companies like Walmart are relying on the government to subsidize their employees uh, living expenses while like Target, almost no one at Target is still like on government assistance. I mean, they still need more money, but literally, I think it's like 90% of Walmart employee, employees have to get government assistance while Target is doing so much yeah. better. Target is a Minnesota company, so I know that. Um, um, well, sorry. Well, let's try Colin. Tim, are you talking about like the 13th Amendment? No, when the, um, I think she said how Walmart much starting pay. Walmart, yeah, Walmart. Oh, okay. okay, so Colin, Tim, and Zane. Uh, um, yeah, I'll go. Or, no, you go, go ahead. ahead I'll go. Go okay. Ahead. Uh, yeah, uh, I was just thinking, like, obviously. I think, I mean, there's obviously a problem with that, but I mean, I think the time that we do spend in college, I think, I mean, there should be, I don't, I don't know the word for it, but a reward, you know, when it comes to money, especially because like, you know, I know like my cousin, she just graduated college and she's, she's a single mother as well, but like, she's, you know, she's still living from check to check, but I mean, she's also had to like, you know, nurture a kid and also she, you know, went through that hard work of four years of college, but I mean, she's still, you know, struggling, but, uh, and I think like with the upper class thing of like them, like, you know, like it's p pitting us together, like the middle class, lower class. I, I mean, obviously, like uh, Jordan said, I believe like it's uh, they're the ones benefiting from it. And I mean, I think it's a problem. But also like what you said, I think if we don't like if we if we just stop, you know, trying to fix the problem and just kind of look past it because we don't think it's going to, you know, there's going to be a solution anywhere down the line. It's obviously going to get worse. So, I mean, it's a difficult situation, but I mean, obviously we can't stop trying. Very good. Zane. <laughs> I've I've uh, brainwashed you. <laughs> <laughs> okay, Colin. I think um like I know in Florida minimum wage is actually on the increase. Um I think college 
prices will go up on the increase as well. But there are states that help with tuition and things of that nature. I think it should be cheaper. I think that there might need to be like, I know we have universities, but make a federal university that's free maybe. Like a true university in each state and just go from there. But I don't know it takes away a state right so then it gets in a weird area so yeah the state's right thing is the south is big on that i think um yeah minnesota isn't that would prefer you know if the federal government could come up with some policies that would level the table more um oh sorry go ahead go ahead tim So for um, well, I think, well, I mean, there's a lot of things I think about how school is, it, it's needed, but I don't think it should be mandatory. Because when you grow up, like your parents, they'll tell you, oh, yeah, you need to go to school, you need to go to school. And some parents are, well, if you don't go to school, they'll like see you as a failure sometimes. But at the same time, school is a high risk, high reward. So I don't, me personally, I don't think if you, if you're not a school person, and but you're very good at what, if you find something you actually like and you're good at it, I feel like that's better than going to school, living out your parents' dream and doing something that you made like. So if you understand what I'm saying. Because some people are like that who didn't really like school, but after being encouraged for years, they finally went. And when it comes to like the pay and how the living is now, I like like how Ryan said, I just don't I just don't see what type of sense it makes. Basically saying if you work at McDonald's, you're not getting no house. That just don't make no sense to me. Like you can't sustain a house if you work at McDonald's, basically because how the, the living expenses are now, you have to work out of two jobs to get a better job. And if you don't go to college, I guess you kind of got to limit yourself to the very good jobs. So it's kind of crazy to me. Yeah. Um, all right, go ahead, Ryan. All right, just speaking of what he said, I was just like looking at this article and it's like about, it's like an act, it's called the raising the minimum Oh, never mind, just kidding. It's called Raise the Wage Act. And they're trying to pass it by like 2025. The minimum wage is a whopping $15. And it said, it says, quote unquote, it says, raising, raising the minimum wage to $15 would help ensure that more low wage workers are paid enough to cover basic living expenses to get a standard, an adequate standard of living which are like $15 when you think about, I mean, I guess it depends on how many hours you work, but then also it's like kind of modern day slavery. If you really think, I, that's how I see it. Like minimum wage jobs is almost like modern day slavery because we're be, it's like getting paid basically less than what you actually deserve. I mean, well, I guess that's opinion, but if you're not getting enough to live then- Yeah, the minimum just, wage has not gone up or not gone up with inflation for 30 plus years. So, I mean, it really is a problem. And again, how do politicians, I mean, you have to be careful about political rhetoric, right? The politicians will talk about the issue in a way that satisfies their donors, their campaign donors. So you do need to find out who's donating to whom. And also just, what do you want? What sort of educational system would you like to have in the, for your children? What would you like to be in place for your children or the next generation? Um, and then, you know, I mean, there's each person can only contribute a tiny little piece to the system, right? But everybody can either help or hurt 
And if they work for 40 years, that's a lot of helping or a lot of hurting over time, right? Uh, Colin, go ahead. Um, another thing to take in consideration is um, they raise their own salaries, like the people in the House and Senate and stuff like that. They vote to raise their own salaries and pass it. Granted, it doesn't take turn like go into effect that term. They would have to be reelected, uh, but the incumbency rate is so high and things of that nature. I, well, how does that compare to CEOs who sit on each other's boards that determine their salaries? Yeah, it's pretty much the same thing in my eyes. One just has a little bit more freedom without having a monopoly, but having a monopoly. Well, the salaries the are about 50 times higher, too, <laughs> right? Uh, yeah, I think DC, right? I don't know how much it was, but last time I looked, it was well into six figures for senators. That's the, but I mean, I'm not defending it. It's just that it's nothing compared to CEOs. Yeah, go ahead. Who's next? Yeah, to talk about what Ryan was talking about, like modern day slavery, if you really want to talk about that, with the 13th Amendment, the uh, additions to, to that, like the for-profit prison system that we have is modern day slavery. Uh, they are companies building prisons and uh, getting them to do manual labor for 20 cents an hour, something like that. Uh, and that in itself goes into how we police ourselves, how we are policed as a nation, because uh, if they need these amount of bodies to go into these prisons to fund these things, then they're going to enforce more laws, enforce certain areas more. So it just goes back into itself about like the education system. If they don't have a stable education, what other option is there for them? It's whatever else is available. You know? Yeah, actually, I read that a, a company will agree to build a prison in a town if the town agrees to keep it 75% full. <laughs> so, you know, <laughs> traffic stops. <laughs> I mean, this stuff is all connected. And it's way more expensive for someone to be in prison than it is for them to have a decent job and pay taxes, right? I mean, your tax money is totally wasted on prison compared to education, <laughs> healthcare, like something else that has a positive effect on people. Um, we also don't have any rehabilitation. Like once people get out of prison, they aren't given like a job, a house, a new, uh, you know, a new start. They're just sort of dumped. And then what, right? They go back to where they were. Go ahead, Alexis. <laughs> Sorry, I, I don't know if you saw me, but I was talking to my mom and I asked her opinion on this. And I was like, mom, do you want to tell me what you think about this? So I look smart in front of class. But um, so I said, mom, do you think minimum wage should be increased? And she said, yes, to at least $13 because gas is now four dollars almost five dollars if i'm making seven dollars an hour that's what minimum wage is in georgia seven dollars an hour two hours doesn't even cover how much i'm like i need to get to work it doesn't even cover that so if i work a four-hour shift i'm making enough to go to work again the next day and it's an endless cycle and to top it off like the people who don't have any time to make make food to go out and buy groceries and stuff um are the people who are working these jobs who need the amount of hours to cover that and so they it goes into the health system it goes into like who can afford like they go get fast food because it's easier and they don't have time to make that food you so, don't have money you're exactly. not even putting into credit people who have to my sister has two kids she's a single mom she does not have enough money to with a seven dollar an hour she does not have enough money to drive to daycare drop off her kids and then drive to work like where where is this is all 
this is all an endless loop of putting us into deeper and deeper debt or making us all struggle even right. more. It's a split between the rich and the poor, and it's getting worse and worse. Monopolies are getting worse and worse. Um, when you have a monopoly, everybody gets overcharged for something. Um, so everybody's, I mean, but you don't see it, right? It's not in front of your eyes. You have to go study it. Um, yeah, insulin was, was a classic one, right? Where it was way overpriced. Um, but the creators of insulin wanted it to be accessible to everyone with any kind of weight because that's how Canada was. Okay. You mean it was socialized or? No. So when the creators of insulin created insulin, what they, they said they would give the like way to create insulin to everyone. Oh, I see. Countries. Give the formula. But they did, when they said they gave the formula to all the other countries, they said, the only thing we want is from you is that insulin be accessible to anyone right. and everyone. Right. And that's as opposed to the Sackler family and the opioid crisis. Do you know about the Sackler family? They knew it was very addictive. Um, yes. And they still kept profiting off it. And they even sent their money to Switzerland because they knew eventually it might catch up with them. Um, the opioid crisis is because of that, specifically because people were like, this is a good solution and it's turning into like uh, barbiturates, which is what people were very hooked on at the time. And opioids was supposed to be this new high tech like solution to that. And it became worse for people and they got addicted to opioids, so. Even worse, yeah, it's even more addictive. Um, so I, I guess I'll finish with, um, I read a book about a guy who was involved in the development of these drugs. And he said, this was in 2003, the book was published. In 20 years, we will have changed the human playing field. We, we will have solved the problems of depression, addiction, pain, and violence. <laughs> really? He's serious. Well, what went wrong? I wrote a whole book about why that guy is crazy, but do you understand how we still keep having faith in STEM? STEM is going to produce the next big thing. And it, it makes money, that's for sure, but it doesn't cure, you know, all these human problems and it doesn't lead to a middle class. So, so many things that can be high tech, you know, the new toy or the new drug. It, if you don't also raise people, train their character, weave people together, have a quality of life, show that you actually care about people, it's not going to work out, right? It's not going to develop the way you want to. Um, anyway, so that's why. I do think you should always remember it can always get worse. And the only thing worse than um, finding out about all the problems is then not doing anything about it. So you just pick the one or two that you want to focus on. That's all. I mean, for me, it was obviously education and the difference between knowledge and wisdom um, and the need to educate for wisdom not just knowledge. I'm sorry, I blew it again. Um, but I wanted to, I guess I don't even need to talk about what we're doing next time because you're gonna get this wonderful video that I'm actually going to make pretty soon before midnight. <laughs> uh, Alexis, sorry about that. Um, but actually next time we're doing women's rights. How's that guys? Um, and the bridge, fun to me. Yeah. Well, the bridge here is that um, what I did in my scholarship, based on a pretty prominent public intellectual, is that I just translated the United Nations capabilities model of development. I just said it's let's just take out the crap in Aristotle and uh, apply it to the UN. Like the UN has kept the good stuff and left out some of the bad stuff. But there's things in Aristotle where his 
really sophisticated list of deliberation and the different kinds of knowledge. All that stuff you can really reflect on in your brain and realize how complicated life is and how complex every decision you make is or could be if you just thought about it for a while. And so there's stuff from Aristotle I would like to keep. But the UN is, is trying in their capabilities model, their goal is to create a strong and stable middle class throughout the world, right? That's the whole point of the UN trying to supplement um, government, government funding and corporate funding. They're trying to, they have a huge peace making force. So sometimes I don't know what your opinion of the UN is because it varies according to the political winds, but uh, the United States is more of a, is more belligerent and ignores the UN more than any other country or it's right up there. Um, because we always ignore them when it comes to war and we wanted to go into the Iraq war. Too bad that the UN voted against it. That's a crappy organization, blah, blah. Okay, but a lot of what they do is not whether they can have war powers. What they do is they have uh, uh, world-class um, heritage sites, natural and cultural heritage sites that are located in poor countries. So they pay to have them made into, into parks, places people can go and to preserve them. But they also have uh, peacekeeping forces in a lot of countries, not the US, but a lot of countries. They contribute to the peace process. And then they have all these other programs, uh, education programs where you have a standardized curriculum. Um, I know I was on a Fulbright and this woman was doing, she was sent to Indonesia to do nursing. And she was going to administrate and um, organize a curriculum for nursing based on the United States, United Nations curriculum. So you'd have an international minimal, <laughs> right, uh, nursing program. And then it's much easier, more efficient and cheaper if you just keep having standardize it. And then you can know what equipment needs to be there, how to set up your classroom. You know how to educate people. You can educate people globally. You can move them into, um, you can exchange ideas, exchange personnel. If one country is, de is developing faster, they can provide personnel for the next country. There's just so much stuff the United Nations is doing. So, you know, if you have time um, for you to go online and just check it all out, it's huge. They're also trying to develop a educational program, a curriculum to teach kids from when they're in kindergarten to live sustainably, right? Which is really important. Um, anyway, so, okay. Um, I'll see you tomorrow, right? We do women's rights tomorrow. All right, bye-bye.